Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this hearing, the first hearing of the year, but the latest in a series of hearings that Senator Blumenthal and I have been able to, to host together. And uh, Senator Blumenthal has just done tremendous, tremendous work chairing this committee. And I've, I've started now to notice a pattern. And this is the fifth or sixth hearing I think we've had. And I've noticed now a, a, a pretty decided pattern. And it goes something like this. You have, on the one hand, all of the AI cheerleaders who say that AI is going to be wonderful. AI is going to be life-changing. It's going to be world-changing. It's, it's going to be the best thing that has ever happened to the human race or something to that effect. And then you have a group of people who have concerns. And they say, well, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, what's AI going to do to jobs? What's AI going to mean for my privacy? What's AI going to mean for my kids? And here's the pattern I've noticed over a year. Almost everybody who takes the AI cheerleading stance is here in this building. And then when you leave the confines of this building and the lobbyists who inhabit it, when you go out and actually talk to real people working real jobs, you find the second set of concerns. I have yet to talk to a Missourian who is an enthusiastic, no-holds-barred cheerleader for AI. Not one. There probably is someone somewhere, but they haven't talked to me yet. What I hear over and over and over from workaday people who are working their job, raising their kids, trying to just, you know, keep it going, what they say over and over is, I don't know about this. I don't know what this is going to mean for my kids online. I don't know what this is going to mean for my job in the future. I just, I don't know. I have concerns. And they also usually say, I sure really wish that Congress would do something about this. And that leads me to the second observation, the second pattern that I have noticed in this last year. And that is while there's a lot of talk about the need for Congress to act, we're beginning to slip into a familiar pattern whereby the biggest companies who increasingly control this technology, just like they've controlled social media, don't want us to act and are willing to expend any amount of resources, money, time, and effort, influence, to make sure we don't. Senator Blumenthal mentioned our bipartisan bill that would just, a, a very modest bill, if I may say, that would just clarify that AI-generated tools are not entitled to the Section 230 protections. Very modest. Do you know when we had AI executives sitting right here in this room and we asked them directly, do you think Section 230 covers your model in your industry? They said no. So Senator Blumenthal and I wrote it up and said, well, good, good. This is consensus. Let's pass this. I went to the floor to try to pass this bill in December and immediately was blocked and objected to. The same story we've been hearing for years from the technology companies. It's always theoretically, we should put safeguards in place for real people. But when you come to do it, it's, oh, no, 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 we can't. That's too soon. It's too much. It's, it's too quick. And what it really means is it would interfere with our profits. I mean, that, that's what they really mean. We cannot allow that pattern to continue with AI. And that's the final thing I notice is, is this, it, it, from the hearings and the information we've gathered, is AI is supposed to be new, but it really is contributing to what is now a, fam a familiar, familiar story, which is the monopolization in this country of information, of data, of, of large swaths of our economy. AI increasingly controlled by two, three, four of the biggest companies, not just in this country, the biggest companies in the world. And apropos of today's subject of this hearing, I think we have to ask ourselves, do we want all the news and information in this nation to be controlled by two or three companies? I certainly don't. I certainly don't. So I think we've got to ask ourselves, what are we going to do practically to make sure that normal people, whether they are journalists, whether they're bloggers, or whether it's just the, the working mom at home, what they can do to protect their work product, their information, their data, how are we going to make sure they are able to keep control of it? How they are able to vindicate their rights? Because they do have rights, and they should have rights. And it shouldn't be that just because the biggest companies in the world want to gobble up your data, they should be able to do it, and you know what? Too bad. We're all just supposed to live with it. So I think we've got a tall task in front of us. I salute Senator Blumenthal again for, for holding these hearings, and I hope that we'll be able to drive towards clarity and then towards solutions, because that's what the American people deserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all the witnesses for being here. Mr. Lynch, if I could just uh, come back to you, because uh, I was struck by your, your comment that uh, the problem with generative AI as it 
exist currently. It's been built with stolen goods. Um, let's just talk a little bit about the, the sort of content licensing framework that, that you would favor. Can you give us a sort of a sketch of what that would look like, something that protects existing copyright law, something that you think would be workable? I'm, I'm not asking you to write the statute for us, sure, but just sure. maybe give us a, a thumbnail overview. I think quite simply, if Congress could uh, clarify that the use of our content and other publisher content for training and output of AI models is not fair use, then the free market will take care of the rest. Just like it has in the music industry where I worked, in film and television, sports rights, you can then, it can enable private negotiations. And you know, in the music industry where you have, you think about millions of artists, millions of ultimate consumers consuming that content, there have been models that have been set up, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR, these collective rights organizations to simplify the licensing of that content. And the nice thing about that is it doesn't take a company the size of Condé Nast or the New York Times to create these licensing deals. These organizations can do it for all content producers. So, you know, fundamentally we think a simple fix as, or clarification that uh, use of content for training and output of AI models is not fair use the market will take care of the rest. I have to say that that seems eminently sensible to me and, and, and it leads me to ask the question, I mean, why shouldn't we re expand that regime outward? I mean, why shouldn't we say that anybody whose data is ingested and then regurgitated by generative AI, uh, whether that's you know their name, their image, their likeness, why shouldn't they be able also uh, to have a right to compensation? I mean, our, our copyright laws are, are quite broad, I think justly so. So, you know, why shouldn't, I, I'm very sympathetic uh, to this uh, argument for journalists and content creators uh, for whom uh, content creation is a career, but there are lots of, of other folks for whom it's not a career, but, but they, they post, they create things, they have work product, they, they post things online. Uh, why shouldn't they also be protected? It seems to me that they should. I mean, it seems to me that, that every American ought to have some rights here in their data and in their content. And uh, the sort of regime you've described, I mean, these are ordinary Americans are already protected by copyright law. It seems that we should find a way to enforce that. And the way that you've described in terms of clarifying fair use seems to me to be a, a potential path forward. Um, Mr. Legette, let me shift gears and ask you about something that, that you said. It's in your written testimony, and you mentioned it, too, just a moment ago about this, this video clip, one of many, unfortunately, uh, with the broadcast TV anchors that was manipulated. And we've seen this is, this is proliferating. You know, the New York Times did a report just a couple of days ago about similar manipulation of, of images. In this case, not news reporters. This was just uh, the Times reported on, uh, for instance, uh, I think a doctor. Uh, online trolls, I'm quoting from the report now, took screenshots of a doctor from an online feed of her testimony she was giving at a parole board hearing and edited the images with AI tools in that case, to make them sexually explicit, you know, completely fake. And this is the classic deep fake, but obviously extremely, uh, extremely harmful, extremely invasive, and then posted them online. I mean, used these images, created these images, and then in this case, put them on, on 4chan. So my, my question to you is, shouldn't there be a, some sort of federal limit, federal ban on deep fake images Certainly of a, of a sexually explicit nature, but, but shouldn't ordinary, every American have the right to think, with appropriate First Amendment exceptions for you know, parody, but, but shouldn't we have the right to think that, listen, you're not just going to, if you put a picture on Instagram of your child, it's not going to be scraped up by somebody, some company or some individual using company software to generate a sexually explicit image, or in the case of these news anchors, to put literally words in their mouth. You are absolutely right to prioritize this issue. For local broadcasters, all our local personalities have is the trust of their audiences. And the second that that is undermined by disinformation and these technologies, these deep fakes are, are going to put all of that on steroids, uh, it is just more noise. And I think we have seen the steady decline in our public discourse as a result of the fact that the public can't separate fact from fiction. Uh, so, so absolutely, this is an area that demands your attention, this committee's attention. Uh, there, there are certainly um, some, some elements of, of, of this that, 
that in the expressive context that the committee needs to be mindful of. Uh, certainly, we've aligned ourselves with the Motion Picture Association and in the creative context, uh, some of the potential carve-outs that, that they have flagged. But this is an issue that is existential for local news. It's existential for our democracy. And so we absolutely support this committee's attention to it. And I would just say in closing, Mr. Chairman, to your point, Mr. Legette, the reason that the public can't separate fact from fiction is in the case of these images. I, I mean, they're, they, they, they look like the real thing. I mean, they're just indistinguishable. I mean, it's not a matter of, oh, you know, the, the public, they're not paying attention. They are paying attention. That's the problem, is that they look absolutely real. And whether you're a broadcaster or a doctor or a mom or whatever, I just think the idea that at any moment you live in the fear that some image of me out there could be manipulated and turned into something completely else, ruin my reputation, and what's your alternative? Go, go file a legal suit and fight that out. And I mean, most people don't have money for that. I, this just seems to me, Mr. Chairman, like a, a situation we've got to address and quickly. Thank you. Just uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. D just one follow-up on fair use, since we were going back and forth on fair use. You're talking about limited readings or broader readings. But correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that currently the, the, the broadest reading possible is the one that these tech companies, AI companies, are adopting, which is their view is, is that, that none of your content should be compensable in any way, right? I mean, Mr. Lynch, have your properties received any form of, of comp licensing compensation from... GAI from these generative AI? No, we have not, and that has been their position. Right. Although they negotiate with us, their starting point is we don't want to pay for content that we know that we should be able to get for free. Right. I mean, anybody, Mr. Legit, different for you? I don't want to speak for every one of my members because I sure. do think there are conversations taking place. It's also hard to paint with a broad brush here. They're between the major tech companies and let alone the, the nascent entrants. But no doubt there are a substantial number of these companies taking that position. Yeah, I, I'm just concerned that, that this is going to be, I mean, if, if they're reading, if the AI companies, which are really just the big tech companies again, if they're reading a fair use prevails, it's that fair use is going to be the exception that swallowed the rule. It's the mouse that ate the elephant. I mean, we're not going to have any, any copyright law left. I mean, it won't be a matter of, well, it's a little too broad. It's a little, it won't exist. It just won't exist. That can't possibly be right. I mean, to see an entire body of law just destroyed, I mean, that can't possibly be right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.